this group of women came together and uh, formed Women's World Banking with the very clear mission of providing access to finance to low-income women. And today we are 29, I guess 30, microfinance providers all over the world um, in 20 countries. And we um, also work with another 24 commercial banks who are increasingly moving into this sector as they see the low-income population as a, a perfectly viable, bankable uh, population. Um, the team that I work with uh, out of New York is uh, really a group of experts, roughly uh, 41 staff, that are experts in things like marketing, corporate governance. They interact you know, on the ground. They're really our, our frontline troops who interact with these uh, 30 network members, diagnose problems, and help them find, find solutions in their business. Um, as I, the slide mentions, we've got um, directly 9 million clients that are um, served by this microfinance, um, set of microfinance providers, and they represent a, a total of about $1.2 billion in loans outstanding. So it's really quite a, a considerable operation around the world. Um, if you want to... So our, our mission is very clearly focused on the poor woman entrepreneur and giving her access to the things that she needs to help her business succeed. And as I said, we are the largest network with the 9 million clients. That is the, the largest, largest network of microfinance institutions. Um, we are very proud of the fact that number 70% uh, of our, our network members are among the number one, two, or three in their market. So these are very high quality institutions, again, globally, in all the, the emerging markets of the world. But as a, <clears throat> as a result of being a Women's World Banking network member, uh, more than 70% of their clients are, are women. And as you can see, the growth rates are pretty extraordinary. Um, the industry is really growing rapidly, and Women's World Banking Network members are, are right alongside. Um, this gives you a picture of sort of, as I say, this extraordinary growth rate that we have seen in the industry. But still, 113 million people have been touched. Their lives have been changed. This is a you know, very impressive performance. But when you think of the, the number of poor people in the world, and the numbers vary anywhere from 3 billion to you know, even higher or lower than that, but the, number, the gap is nonetheless very, very great. And there's still an enormous amount of work that we still can do in this field. Um, the other kind of interesting trend that um, that we're seeing is that there's a very strong concentration in the sector. So about 85% of those clients, of those 113 million people who have been served by microfinance, are really only working with 2% of the microfinance institutions in the world. So there's a, a, a quite a concentration in the industry. But what we're really seeing in uh, at Women's World Banking is that it's great to talk about numbers and outreach is absolutely essential, but we're really trying to focus more on what kind of impact you can have on the, the individual client, and in this case, particularly the, the low-income woman. And as a result, we're really very focused, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, on the second challenge, which is really trying to um, increase the breadth and quality of products that are offered to, to this low-income women population. This gives you a bit of a sense, again, of the regional breakdown. Microfinance is, is present uh, throughout the world, but again, you see very, very varying uh, rates of penetration, but everywhere, it's, I think it's safe to say that there just uh, isn't enough uh, outreach to the population that could really, really benefit. One of the very interesting trends, as I alluded to earlier, is just how commercial the industry is becoming and the kinds of institutions that are, are entering. Um, and what you're seeing right now is the highest rates of growth are those institutions that started life as NGOs, but that have made the decision to become regulated financial institutions in their domestic market. And so that's that transformed group you see up at the top that um, are really experiencing tremendous growth, and we've seen the number of institutions making that strategic decision um, really growing in the last few years. You're starting to see, as I mentioned before, commercial banks increasingly coming into um, this sector, and uh, I think one of the things we're most excited about is that a lot of them are forming partnerships with microfinance institutions and recognizing that this is a fairly unique business, a unique sector, and uh, they're partnering with, uh, with institutions, including those in our network. But 
with this pro transformation process, we are seeing a, a worrying trend. There is a bit of a the beginning of a silver a cloud behind the silver lining that with an increase in commercialization, with an increased move away from the NGO model to a commercial bank model, you're seeing the average percentage of women clients falling. And if you remember, part of the reason microfinance has been such a successful poverty alleviation tool has been the focus on women clients. And so we've done um, some fairly extensive research and are just about to publish a paper on this, but this is really a, a concern of ours and of our network members who are, are quite committed to that that population. <clears throat> well, this next slide helps. Um, it helps that exactly. I mean, a big, a big part of it is as a microfinance institution commercializes, becomes much more um, focused on the bottom line, and has much more of a pro profit incentive. The average loan size almost always has to increase, and that typically means you're going to go to a, man, a, a male business as opposed to a women's business who, uh, women's businesses the world over, including in this country, grow it at much smaller rates. And what this slide is 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 illustrating is that our, our network member in uh, Morocco, a terrific organization, the, dom the dominant leader in its market, for many, many years held its... Uh, its maximum loan size to 3,500 dir dirhams. And at that level, 93% of its client base was very able to, to uh, assume that kind of level of debt and repay. And if you see, the breakdown was really 60-40, mo uh, more or less, um, between uh, women and men. And that was a, a very successful strategy for them. As they started borrowing more commercially and had profit pressures to uh, to answer to, they made the decision to increase the maximum loan size to um, whatever the monthly net profit was for the given business, which made this actual size of loan much less accessible to their client base. And then you see a really dramatic shift away from women clients. So that's that's really one of the, the main reasons is this shift in, in loan size. But if this is a Uh, th they are, but the institution. Oh, sorry. Um, the the question was, uh, if the small loans are still available, aren't women still coming to the institution for them? And then they are, but it's really more a question: Is the institution willing to make them? Is it economically viable for them to continue to make? Um, and is it efficient for them to make the the small loan? And so, this the next slide I think is really where Women's World Banking is convinced that there can be an alternative strategy to growth that allows microfinance institutions to stay with their women clients, and that's by sort of getting out of this lending cycle. As long as we're focused on microcredit and only credit, you're going to find yourself in this trap that I was describing before. But more and more institutions, um, including those in our network, are starting to vary the products that they offer. And so we think there, there's, some real, there's some real hope for, uh, for the future and for retaining um, women's, women clientele. Um, and in response, we have just finished an exhaustive uh, three-year strategic planning process and uh, really felt that Women's World Banking's place in this industry was to be the preeminent voice on this issue in, in our industry. And as I mentioned earlier, we're very, very keen on expanding that outreach. 113 million borrowers is just not enough in comparison to the need. And there are many places um, where, where microfinance is barely, is barely touched. But numbers aren't enough. We really want to be about both reach and impact on the lives of these women. And one of the things in the left-hand bottom corner, one of the things that is really quite unique about Women's World Banking and something that my sense is you at Google would understand well, is as a network, probably one of the most valuable things that we bring to our network members, and certainly the thing that in our network member satisfaction surveys always comes back, is their ability to learn from each other and the lateral learning process that we provide through workshops. And probably even more importantly and interestingly is we, we do um, a series of exchange visits where we'll have a network member that's launching a product go to someone who's really established some best practice, has taken some hard knocks, learned how to do it well, not to do it well. And it's quite a, a very structured process. They're not shopping trips. Um, and it's, it routinely gets the highest marks from our network members. And the thing that they say is the reason why they want to stay in the network, because they're learning 
from their peers. And then finally, um, I, I just felt that uh, it was important as our strategic planning process that I focused uh, on our work as an institution, as an organization, and becoming a, as a high performance an organization as we could. So I thought I'd just talk a little bit about what the pillars of these, the strategy is. Um, certainly, the women's market and women's leadership is going to be a central part of the work we do. And we do that in lots of different ways. We've got quite a unique customer research um, function where we spend a lot of in-depth time establishing gender baseline studies in, the, in our network member countries and measuring how women's needs, how they're motivated um, in, in business and in their, their domestic household savings and, and, uh, and finance, and then what their behaviors are. And so we work with our, our network members to, to do that, that really in-depth research. And coming out of that research then is this product development function, which um, we really f see as the future um, of microfinance as opposed to, to microcredit and as a way for institutions to retain and, and grow their client base in a profitable way while retaining their, their women clientele. Um, and the range of products that we're really focusing on um, is helping these group lenders that I was talking about before move to an individual lending model. And once institutions have a sense of how you do cash flow based lending, because these these women, these, these poor uh, borrowers t typically don't have collateral, um, it allows us to then build in a whole range of other products such as housing finance and housing improvement loans, which is really one of the most popular. As I was saying before, we're really focused on sort of what are women's needs and what are their motivations? One of the things that poor women are very, very good at and very keen on doing is, is savings. And they want to save in small amounts. So we work with our network members to, um, to improvise and devise um, savings products that allow women to do that. They also want their savings to be kept confidential so that their husbands don't necessarily know they're saving. Um, we also then work with the, uh, the institutions to market the products in a way that'll be really appealing to these women and hit them <clears throat> on what their motivations are and so again one of the most uh, profitable and most um, sought-after savings product is an education savings product so we've been um, very successful in rolling that out in a couple of our network members and then <clears throat> the uh, the third the third pillar is an area that has become a much much uh, more critical part of our work which is helping our network members uh, access capital uh, to grow their businesses, basically, from the international capital markets. You've seen a flood of capital from local commercial banks, local capital markets, international capital markets, and the institutions that we're working with really need that capital to grow. They're not going to be able to rely on the, the source of donations and, uh, and grant financing that really started the industry. And then, as I mentioned, we're um, very involved in this process of transformation as our network members make a strategic decision to move from the NGO model to a, a nonprofit a profit making model we work very closely with them in a whole range of ways to to make that really quite enormous leap uh, in in their structure and uh, an exciting part and what we were all quite excited about at, at WWB is um, we are launching an equity fund in order to be able to take a stake in our network members as they raise capital to become um, fully regulated financial institutions. And, and I think even just a few years ago, that may not have been of much interest to our network members, but they now are coming to us and saying, we're really worried that we're going to lose our social mission. We understand we need to make this transformation, but we want to make sure that we do it in a way that's that's um, keeps us committed. And we want you, Women's World Banking, at the table. So we hope to be taking significant minority stakes in the institutions so that we have board seats, um, so we can continue to play that, that sort of mission-driven role um, going forward. I think this next slide just touches back briefly on that, that product um, pillar that I was talking about earlier and just, just you know, makes the point that throughout the life cycle of both men and women. There are all sorts of financial service needs. And so to say that poor people only need credit and only need to be borrowing is really kind of missing the point in, in a lot of important ways. So we're really looking to develop products over time that that hit um, the different ports, points of the 
of the life cycle. I think one of the ones that we're most excited about and really speaks to Women's World Banking's role in the gender space is uh, <clears throat> trying to develop a health insurance product. Micro insurance is sort of the new buzzword in, in our field. Only 3% of the insurance products that are out there in the, the micro space are health insurance, and none of them have any prenatal or maternal care coverage included in them. And so we really feel strongly that that's probably the greatest need of this client base. And so um, we're really hoping to work with our, our network members to design that product. We're, we're piloting a product with our, our Jordanian affiliate um, in 2008 and hoping to take those learnings um, and find a way to roll that out um, more globally. So I think it would be uh, not, uh, not wise of me to leave the room without telling you how much uh, all of this is going to cost. Um, we see the, the sort of core business, the work that I've just described to you as running roughly $30 million over the, the next three years. But we're really keen to expand as well um, in a number of ways into some of the more underserved populations. We've had a, a longstanding presence in India, but there's still a lot to be done. China is totally untouched by microfinance, and there is, uh, as you can imagine, an enormous need, particularly in the rural areas. And Women's World Banking has a... Um, a, uh, a bit of a cutting edge right now in, in rural finance, and so we're hoping to, to figure out what an appropriate China strategy is. Brazil, again, largest country in Latin America, you know, single-digit penetration of microfinance. There's, there's no microfinance to speak of in Brazil, and we'd really like to, um, to help expand that. We also feel that we are not deep enough in Africa. We have some superb organizations there, but we need to be um, more broadly uh, based there. And then I think if you're if you're going to focus on a women's empowerment uh, uh, strategy, certainly the Middle East is an important part of that uh, that puzzle. We've got three excellent uh, affiliates in the Middle East now, but we there's a lot more demand, a lot more countries that we think we can expand to. And then, as I mentioned, the the equity fund um, will be raising 25 million dollars in this first. I like calling it the first fund um, to put into this this basket of network members that we've worked with, you know, in some cases for 30 years and know intimately and really want to be with them in this next phase of their journey. So we're really looking for advocates and visionaries to join us in uh, realizing some of this really exciting new uh, frontier and the next steps in what is a incredibly dynamic industry. Um, as an East Coaster, it's a little difficult to admit that the West Coast has really taken um, the lead in philanthropy, and so it's uh, really a delight to be here with you in, uh, in the home of a lot of that, and uh, we're really looking for partners out here. And we're very interested in thinking about how you might be able to, to help us in, uh, in those next steps. Um, it, it occurs to me as I'm talking to you that it is much as I'm, I'm sure you're just fascinated by everything I have to say, I really wish I had one of my network members with me because the, the leaders, particularly some of the women leaders, have incredible personal stories and have overcome you know, tremendous odds to run world-class financial institutions. Uh, I really I wish I had uh, Dr. Jennifer Riria, who's the, um, the leader of our, our member in Kenya. The client story I told you about earlier is, uh, is one of hers. She is the fourth of uh, four girls. Her father did not pay for transport for her mother back to back home from the hospital when she was born. He was so upset with the birth of another daughter. And he really felt there was no need to educate her beyond the rudimentary primary level. So she ran away from home. And she lived with a, a relative in Mombasa, which was the, the largest city nearby, and, and really fought her way through to an education. She's got a, a doctorate from uh, Birmingham uh, University in the UK. She's just an extraordinary individual. And, and she speaks to the reality of what we're doing on the ground. In Infinitely more than I can, so we would we would love to to think about bringing them here. And I don't know whether that's something that might be of interest to all of you in, in the future. But um, let's keep that in mind, and I'd love to answer your questions. <clears throat> Thanks. Yeah. Did you mention? Oh, sorry. You mentioned that there is uh, about some number of 3 billion poor people, and there you have 113 million people currently borrowing money. Um, do you have any idea of what's the upper limit? So not everybody's sort of cut to be an entrepreneur, right? So 
do you know what what's your target like if in an ideal world how many people would you like to be able yeah, to right right to help? well and, and that's a really that's a, actually a really great question because microfinance has really been fostered on the idea that you're not lending to the absolute poorest of the poor. You're lending to people who've sort of taken that one step towards an entrepreneurial vision and and recognize that they need to lift themselves out of poverty. So, you know, there's so many different estimates. That $3 billion is people living under $2, $2 a day. That's probably more in the poorest of the poor territory. So if you think maybe half of that, um, I know a lot of people talk about one billion borrowers as being really the target of where the industry would really love to, to be able to get. <coughs> and uh, and uh, one more question, sorry. Yeah, please. And do you have any idea, the 113 million, how many... Oh. Hello, hello, yes. Yeah. Do you have any idea of uh, how, many, how many people the 113 million actually indirectly help because they employ other people and so... What is the you know the effect? No, I I, I don't have those numbers, but um, actually the business I told you about Joyce's that's actually quite unusual for a micro business to employ 25 people. You know, much much more common is woman starting a business in her home and then maybe extending it to some of the people around her. So m micro enterprises don't usually grow all that large, although. Roughly 15% of the of the uh, women in any of these borrowing groups do have lending needs or borrowing needs beyond what that that sort of counter uh, guarantee model will allow. So there is some growth there, but I'm afraid I don't I don't have exact employment statistics for you. No. No. Yeah. Um, the question was, uh, do you have any sense of repayment and and how much money gets lost or makes its way back? No, that's that's actually the amazing part of the microfinance story and why that original model, I think, was so compelling in telling the story that the poor do repay. Repayment rates worldwide are 98%. And it's really quite, quite extraordinary. And given what we're all going through in this country with the subprime crisis and credit card debt, it's really uh, quite extraordinary. But no, repayment rates are, are really extraordinary. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your attention. It was really, really great meeting you. Thank you.